Hello, and welcome to the Movers and Shakers podcast. My name is Gino Barbaro, co-founder of Jake and Gino, multifamily investor, educator, father, and mentor. Today's guest is Christina Kovach, realtor and broker owner of the home agency in Florida since 2014. Christina started her real estate career as a loan officer at 20 years old and quickly developed a passion for investing in real estate. Since 2010, she's flipped and held over $7 million in residential real estate holdings. And today she's focusing on building her multifamily portfolio, among other things, which we're going to talk about in the show, serving as a limited partner in 731 units and a joint venture in 97 units. Welcome to the show, Christina. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. You know, Christina, I I wanted to jump into your past, into your you know, into your past, into your bio, and how you got into real estate. But you said something very enlightening to me, and I wish I'd known this ten years ago. But we're going into a downturn right now, and you said if you don't have multiple streams of revenue right now, you're screwed. Can you expand upon that a little bit? Because you've got a little bit of everything going on. Your husband's got a couple of businesses. You've got the real estate. You've got some short term rentals. How did you come to that revelation? Re revelation. I. Like in the bio, it, you said 20 years old, I was a loan officer. So I always did things a little bit unconventional. Um, I quit college at UMass Boston to become a loan officer because I saw an ad that I could make $100,000, which I did do. But in, that's actually how I met Attila. We bet, met there. But with that, we both realized we didn't want to be part of the corporate world. And we decided to quit at the same time. And ever since then, we've just been grinding and hustling to make this on our own without having the corporate overhead on us. So that's what we've done. And so I didn't know what I was doing initially, but the, what happened was we ended up having multiple streams of income from multiple businesses, different industries and asset classes. And it's just been brilliant, unknowingly brilliant, right? Like, so uh -huh. I do get worried about people that have just one W2 stream of income um, for their family. And if something does happen, you are screwed. And so it's so important to diversify and invest and not just count on your 401k and your W-2. Take me back to that time when you told your parents, I'm quitting college, I'm going to become a loan officer. How did that yeah. go? Not the best. I mean, even the person I worked for, she was a mentor to me. I was, she was grooming me to become a recruiter in her temp agency, which I had worked for for years as a temp um, throughout school. And she also was like, you're making the biggest mistake of your life. And I'm like, well, you know what? I'm going to do it. I just, in my gut, I feel like I need to do this. I ended up finishing school eventually, but it did, I did lose a lot of credits along the way. Um, but I did want that underneath my belt. And so I did finish. Um, but it certainly was a bold move and it turned out for the best. I feel like it really shaped me for the future. And then when you got into real estate, you went directly into real estate sales, into residential and starting flipping homes. So with real estate, it was our first house that we bought in 2009 in Fort Lauderdale for, get this, $55,100. So, <laughs> all of our cash. Boom. There you go. So we bought this house, this little 900 square foot house, and it was a total gut job. I and mean, we were everything from tile to drywall to five layers of roofing that we had to peel off and it just was a crap house, um, but we made it beautiful. And my dad flew down from Vermont to teach us how to do all of this um, because we had limited funds. We were literally doing 0% balance transfers on our credit card to help pay for the renovations. So it was like, we just kept juggling and making it work. And that eventually became a live-in flip, which we didn't know we were doing at the time, but we moved into the next house, did the same exact thing in the next house. And then we ended up starting to flip, realizing that we were pretty, pretty good at this. And it wasn't that hard. And then with that first house, I also realized selling real estate is not that hard. So it takes nothing to get a real estate license. I mean, if you live in Florida and you have a driver's license, you also have a real estate license, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's how it works, huh? How did, you end up, yeah. how did you end up in Florida though, from, from, up, from the Northeast back then, back in 2008, 2009? So when Attila and I both quit the mortgage company, um, that was a subprime mortgage company back in 2004, we moved to San Diego together. So we're just kind of living that little surfer dream, even though we never really surfed and we're not like that at all. Um, but it, it sounded good at the time. Um, lived there for two years. And then we bought into a franchise where Attila was doing um, subcontracting work for this anti-theft device for vehicles. So we found out the Florida territory was open. So we purchased that territory to get back on the East Coast. Oh, that's pretty cool. Is he still in that business right now? 
Yeah, so that's one of our businesses and one of our streams of income. And so that one in particular, when a market is not doing as well, there's more theft on the rise. And so that business actually does better when the market's not doing as well. That's crazy. So you get to Florida, you you fix the first house for 55000 Christina, why do you do things so difficultly, though? You, it seems like you, you like to struggle. I mean, like, you, you, you quit. It's all I knew. It's all we both knew. We both, we, we don't come from a lot of money, either family. So it's just like, this is what you got to do. And my, my whole family is very hands on and we just get things done DIY. I'm a, a mentality, right? Uh -huh. And that's just all we knew. And so eventually, one of the breaking points was actually in Connecticut because we ended up getting short-term rentals in Connecticut and Vermont. And I started flipping in Connecticut for a little while because I had this dream of being an opposite of a snowbird and living in New England in the summer and get out of this heat and then winter in Florida. But in the end, um, the breaking point was when contractors didn't show up to one of my flips and I ended up having to redo the deck myself. Like Attila got me started, but he had to get back on a flight to get back to Florida to deal with some clients. And we had to, we have a time crunch. Every time is money. So I ended up finishing this deck, hauling these twelve foot deck boards and sawing them and nailing them in myself. And it it was awesome, like in the end. But I never wanted to do it again. I was like, oh, cool, I did it, but I never want to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> I can so see that too. You know what I'm saying? Like these deck boards are three times the length of you and, oh and putting them down. And, and so you do that and you're saying to yourself, you got to keep going. You learn that. And then from there, that dream is crushed, right? But the great thing about it is at least you try stuff and you're not the kind of person that, hey, I'm afraid of something. Let me tackle it. So then you do that. You come back down to Florida. And then when is your, I guess, passion for multifamily Kindle. But when do you see that as, hey, this is another great vehicle that I can start creating some type of income from that? Yeah, so I didn't know a lot about it whatsoever. And I went to a conference. Um, actually, one of your students, Chad King, he had a conference back in 2020. Mm. And it was a virtual one. So it was just I hopped on and I learned about how this is all possible. And obviously, through your podcast, I learned about it as well. But that was that that was my first conference and that's where I really could dive deep and find out about multifamily and the benefits there are to it and the scalability and how I can make the risk spread amongst multiple units, not just this one single property in this one piece of land or multiple partners, you know, and then another diversification. So a different asset class. And so that's where I started digging deeper. And so I started making phone calls and I spoke with Julie Peterson over at old capital because I was like, okay, I got this much money. I can have put this much down and it's what I can afford. Tell me, tell me what you can give me. And she's like, I'm not giving you crap. <laughs> you know, like she's like, you need at least two years of experience, you know? And I was like, what? Like, I didn't know that. So that was an oh, eye opener. And then I realized I need to start networking. And that's when I started looking for a uh, coach and mentorship. So take, I want to take you back to 2009. And if you're doing that with the single family, do you think you would have, become more successful in that venture if you had invested in your education with a single family uh, flipper fixer would that have helped you th you think back then possibly but yeah I just wasn't even that mental space either for networking and it was all I'm gonna do it I got it you know I just I didn't know about using other people's money either in that sense and it just we everything we've done we build up ourselves and we've always proven things on our own and that's been the only trajectory we knew how to do. So I don't even know if I would have considered it. So talk yeah. to the listeners right now, because that's such an, an awesome point, because I am in the same place you are. I had a one restaurant for 20 years, and I'm the person. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And I'm just not going to grow. It's just that simple. I mean, like, I'm a can't be in five different places. And right. I was really stuck. And it was a challenge for me to, to, to adopt that growth mindset. And I had this, I had that scarcity mindset instead of the abundance mindset. Mm -hmm. Walk me through when was the shift of like, wow, multifamily is a team sport. I don't have to do everything myself. We can go out there and we can network. Do you know a specific story when, when that happened to you? I mean, when I joined Jake and Gino, that was the first time I was ever networking with anybody. <laughs> like I don't network in South Florida. It's just, it's a little creepy sometimes even like, it's just not, it's a boys club in a lot of sense. And it's, I just never felt welcomed. And so when I joined Jake and Gino, it was just, okay, everyone's family oriented and knowledgeable and wants to share their knowledge. No one, no one's, it's a, a selfless community. 
And that made me feel so comfortable to show up and just listen and be ready to, to take it all in. And so that was the major shift. And then I'm like, this, that's when I knew it was going to happen. And one of the things, that, and then of course, a year, 10 months, 11 months go by and I don't have a deal yet, but it's okay. But one of the things you always kept saying was just like, fall in love with the process, not just the results. And I just keep telling myself that, telling myself that it's like, this is, this is the long game period, even after we've invested. Mm -hmm. so. And you started and you joined when the market was at a high, right? And you, everyone's probably saying, well, you're, I can't get in now. The market's too high. I can't get in now. The market's too high. Now, all of a sudden, it seems like there's deals coming. We're closing on a deal <laughs> tomorrow, as a matter of fact, uh, the, you know, the, the in, in January. And all of a sudden, people are saying, well, you know what? I can't get in now because interest rates are too high and there's a lot of risk. I want you to push back on that and tell people listening to this why they need to get into real estate today. Why is it an awesome time today, even better than when you got into it? Yeah, I mean, there's no better time than now. And that's at any point in the cycle, as long as you're buying right. And that's what we keep, we learn. And bottom line is there's probably some operational or ad you're doing a value add of some sort to make this worth it with the current interest rate you're getting. You know, you're going to be able to get rents or lower expenses to get that NOI boosted up. So it's just finding those pain points, right? With the seller and knowing that you can come in and fix that property or operate that property better than they did. Mm -hmm. So there's always going to be an opportunity. It's just finding those needles in the haystack, but there there's plenty of them. You look. So it sounds as if you were lacking confidence mm -hmm. early on. And I think lack of confidence comes from lack of education as well. I mean, you, you, you obviously have dove into it. I mean, 11 months is a long time. Jake and myself took 18 months. I mean, that's how long it took us. And talk about the struggle. And and we're at a much better part of the market cycle to buy deals because there were a lot more deals. It just wasn't no sentiment, no money. Mm -hmm. What did you tell yourself to say, hey, tr okay, it's great. People listening saying, yeah, trust the process. What does that mean to trust the process? And how did you say to yourself, I'm not going to jump into the instant gratification. I'm not going to jump into mm -hmm. a bad deal. I'm going to push that off. And I'm going to wait until I find the deal that I'm looking for. Yeah. So that was a major part. I, there were deals that came my way, but alignment with the partners wasn't there and feel like, and the deal was maybe a little bit too thin. And I was like, why, why push this just to get a deal, you know? Mm -hmm. So ultimately the process for me was finding the right people to partner with because the two JV deals that I'm in, we plan to hold them long-term. It's a generational wealth play. Nobody wants to sell. We just want to refi when the time is right. And that's in the underwriting and the business plan. But the people that we're surrounded with and that we're dealing with every single week, those are people that I want to hang out with and not just talk about real estate. You know, it's that makes it part of the fun. Also, as you know, I, I'm unconventional things that I've done in the past, I can't just do the grind. Like I need, I also need to have fun and enjoy it and that's what life's all about, right? Like, what are we doing? Just here to crunch numbers and, you know. I'm, I'm, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm taking notes as you say this because there's a lot of the, those last two minutes that you've just spoken. Everyone really needs to go back and rewind this because I'm going to ask questions about that. But what I heard is to learn yourself, learn what you love to do. Mm -hmm. If you're the number cruncher, great. Go for it. But if you like to have fun and enjoy the process, do that. I think- uh, what you did and summed up, because I want to ask you, how did you choose those people? Because you go through some people that don't work and some that do work. Mm -hmm. How did you choose the right people? For us, we call it values-based decision-making. You're trying to align yourself with people who have the right values and also the right uh, investing framework or, or the investing mentality, long-termism. You don't want to sell these deals. If you're going mm -hmm. on with partners who are like, okay, one day we're going to flip this deal. The next day we're going to hold this deal. Can you talk to me about how a person listening to the show right now should vet out a potential partner? It just takes time, like any relationship, you know, your spouse that you're with right now, <laughs> you didn't just say, Hey, let's do this, you know? So that's exactly what you're doing with these partners too. You are marrying them in a sense, because especially if it's a generational wealth play, you have this for long-term. So it's, you have to date them kind of. And so with every single person, every single event that Jake and Gino hosted, every event that MIH hosted, you just meet everybody and you get to know them over time and it doesn't happen overnight. So they like you and they want to stay in contact with you. That's what happens and vice versa. It just is a natural progression if that can't be forced. And so that's what happened in my case. And I have lifelong friends in this situation and also partners 
for okay. a very long time. That's awesome. So you're talking about finding the right people. you got to learn yourself. You have to learn what, what your strategy is. Now, as you're going on, going long term, as far as the deals themselves, anything you want to talk about the deals, any challenges, anything you learn from investing in your first multifamily, that's something that, that I really like to learn about. Yeah. So the first one that I ever invested in was in Kansas City, a 54 unit. Mm -hmm. And I didn't find the deal. Two of the partners found a deal. They already had 130 units in that market prior and within their own family. And they had never partnered outside um, of their own family before. So with their trust relationship that they have through other networks, like with, with Marco and MIH, that's how I met them. Mm -hmm. And then the other partners... So I met through Jake and Gino, Deb and Keone, and Dimitri and Katia. So with them, we had this foundation already built from over a year ago, you know? And so we, and so since then, I partnered with Deb and Keone and Dimitri and Katia in another deal. And so we just are kind of moving together. Um, and with that deal is value add play um, on CapEx, but also on operations. So a funny little story on operations. We we're getting some tenants out, and one of the tenants, uh, when they were doing the walkthroughs, <clears throat> had extremely large snakes and also bred rats for those snakes. So that was the first one of the first things to get. It's just like I didn't know that was even possible in an apartment, and I, that would scare the crap out of me <laughs> if I lived nearby. Uh, so that was one of the first things that, unfortunately, we're going to have a non renewal because they were on month to month. So. But so that, that was a very interesting thing. This is possible, right? Things, uh, the unexpected happen. And what's great about it is you live in Florida, so you should be used to snakes and alligators, oh, but I guess, I guess no. you're not in somebody's <laughs> apartment. I mean, if you could charge them a couple hundred bucks a month, I mean, maybe. No, <laughs> there's not enough. <laughs> <laughs> I no. mean, if someone's listening. I, what I love about your, your strategy is you've got businesses. So anybody out there, they may be a realtor, they may be fixing and flipping homes, they may be having other businesses. But what I, I love what you're doing, you have your other businesses, you get you're making that money, that transactional money, and you're you're putting it into multifamily. I mean, mm -hmm. is that would you advise that to a lot of people who say, Hey, I don't have the time, but this vehicle is so awesome, because this is the vehicle right here that really lends to be bu building uh, that that long term generational wealth that you talk about. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we are, we're hedging against inflation with inflation rent increases to where the, these properties that we're adding value to, we're increasing the NOIs and with the proper business plan in place, we are, we are executing this with, I'm leveraging these, everyone's experience. We have a collective knowledge as a group, you know, there's no way to fail in a sense. There is, it's possible. The whole place could burn down and then we have to deal with insurance, but really it's a very low risk situation that anything could go bad, especially with the amount of experience collectively that we all have and the way that we're going to execute this business plan to get it up and running to where we project it to go. So with that, and then ultimately with this the single families, you just have that one property, it could fail. And mm -hmm. With 54 units, the risk is spread amongst those 54 units. And there's a lot you're saying there because I, I, I want to stop you for a second because what you're saying and everybody, if you first start out and you're dying to get a deal, it's not going to happen overnight. It takes a little time to learn the business plan. It takes a little time to learn to market. Kansas City, talking about Kansas City, I'm a believer. Yeah. I love the market. Why did, why did you choose Kansas City? Yeah, I chose it be, and that area is just growing tremendously. Honestly, I overlooked it for so long. I was looking in my backyard and it's just very difficult. Um, and I didn't have the right partners here in this area. Um, but with the $2 billion airport renovations and become an international airport in Kansas City, uh, Google, Meta, they have gigafactories there. There's multiple other factories and industries growing there consistently. And so on the Kansas, Kansas side and the Missouri side, it's just booming. And then some uh, tertiary markets like Springfield are also booming. So having having that the people that have been there lifelong and the boots in the ground having their knowledge and expertise is crucial as well so and we're in that 54 unit we're just a few miles from downtown where when we went there for one of the boot camps i was just that i went there before buying in there so it, without being there i don't know if i would have gone into the deal but being there at one of the jake and gino boot camps and 
I was like, wow, this is Kansas City. <laughs> but let's be honest. When you went into that airport, you must have said to yourself, where am I? Am I, oh am I in the 1940s yes. bunker? I mean, that airport was awful. There, I, I think the World Cup is going there in a couple of years. Yes, I, I, that's what's are. going on. So that's great market mm -hmm. research. And you're seeing infrastructure growing. But that's the crazy thing. When you overlook it, don't overlook it. Look at the markets. And I remember going to that to that boot camp and looking at the properties. And I mean, it's an, it is an, an amazing market thinking that, you know, you're a New Yorker or someone from Florida discounting that market. I, that's awesome. But take me back two years, you know, when you first started, would you envision yourself like flying to Kansas City yeah. and buying property, huh? Absolutely not. No, I always, Florida, people are flocking to Florida, right? And I'm in Florida, but I'm also in Fort Lauderdale, Miami. So no matter what, for me, if I wanted to go into Central Florida, it still takes me three hours. So I, honestly, I'd rather just get on a direct flight and it's the same thing rather than being in a, a car. So that is awesome. That's a that's a great insight. I mean, the problem with Florida is that valuations are so high because everyone is moving here. And and when are they going to reset? And like you're 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 hedging your bet against do I continue to buy or should I slow down and just go somewhere else? I love what you did. I mean, I'm in Florida myself. I moved into Florida five years ago to, to buy here, and prices were high back then, so we continue to buy in Knoxville. So yeah. it's sort of the sort of the same thing. If somebody's listening to this right now and they're saying, "I've got a business." I'm doing pretty good in it, but I know that income is going to slow down during the recession or I've, mm -hmm. I'm in single families or I'm a realtor. What are the, what are, what are the next few steps that I need to do to become serious about getting into multifamily and start expanding my income? The biggest thing is networking, which I hate that word so much because it was so scary to me initially. So ultimately I've been just engaging, just engage and be authentic and you will attract who you're supposed to attract. It, it will come naturally. There's some people you just want to jive with and that's okay. Not everyone needs to love you. So I, that's the biggest thing is just stay engaged, stay consistent and be authentic. So what makes you scared about networking? What's scary about the word networking? I mean, I, it's horrible. <laughs> it's when you I think of networking in the past before Jake and Gino, before it was actually a comfortable space and safe space, honestly, um, it just was a bunch of douchebags and like everyone already kind of knew each other. You couldn't really get into a, a conversation if you're an outsider and, well, that's it's not really that's not really networking. See, the problem is that, that 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 what you're describing is I don't even know how to describe something like that because when you go to network, you really have to set expectations. You're really there to provide value to other people, right. and you're really there to listen to other people. Where everyone does it the other way around. So, what can you do for me? So you go in there. Well, you don't have any properties. You don't have anything, but you just never know who you're speaking to. And right. you know, two years from now, you've got you know properties in Kansas city. And those people could have been come partners of yours, or you could have raised money with them. That that's the problem with networking and, you know, getting into it. And it's funny, it's ironic that you say that because five or six years ago, there was a lot less women in multifamily. Now it's, there, there are more women in multifamily yeah. and there's, there's a big disruption going on, on the thing. But how does networking look like for you now? Cause I know you're not just networking, whether it's in MIH or Jake and Gino, what yeah. do you do now? What do you do now? That's different. I mean, now you obviously have more confidence. Now you have mm -hmm. more credibility. What, how does it look like for you now? Yeah. So obviously the confidence and credibility, but still from the beginning, it was coming into a space where I felt comfortable. And that was, that was just the breaking point of like, I can, the barrier to get over. And then from there it, it was staying humble and listen and engage and show up. First of all, showing up is the first step. Um, but yes. yeah, so now it's a totally different situation where I, I, I do feel comfortable and I'm expanding outside of our two groups that we have here and women's groups. And I'm, I found myself being someone that can, someone, I want to be there for anyone that wants any help or advice and to break into the space, especially as a woman. And be there to add value in any way possible. So what's the next step for you then? What is that next step for you in multifamily? You're going to continue to buy. I know you're going to continue to work with your husband on his businesses. What, mm -hmm. what, what else is, what else is on the horizon for you? Yeah. So at this point I want to get the 54 unit we have, we're still stabilizing. So I want to really focus in on that. And then the 43 unit, it's doing really well with a great property manager as well. But I just want to make sure that as we come into something that we're a little unknown territory of some things are getting a little separate. I just want to focus on those. And if a great deal comes, it, I am, I'm ready and I have cash that, that can be allocated for it. Um, but I'm not, I, I'm also want to make sure operationally and that these properties get to 
um, stabilize. Mm -hmm. I should have asked you this sooner. I'm sorry. I forgot. What did your husband yeah. say to you when you said, I want to do multifamily? Did he think you were crazy? No, I mean, he lets me, I, well, lets me, but I buy houses with him, not even seeing them. He trusts my judgment 100%. And we have a really good, really good support system for one another. We call each other, each other's backup dancers. We so literally have did, each other's back. But how did you, I, how did you pitch it to him? Cause you have to, I mean, he trusts you, but what did you say to him? Hey, we want to buy these. We want to get the multifamily. Cause I, you know, a lot of people when they first see it, they're, they are looking at a 50 unit apartment complex and they're saying to themselves, I, I can't, who owns this? We can't own this. How did you, cause for, there's a lot of spouses in the Jake Gino community. One of them is really on board. The other one needs a little convincing. Did you have to do a little convincing or how did you paint the picture to him to say, Hey, I, I really want to get into multifamily. Yeah. So I mean, just showing him, the scalability of this and that honestly it's less work physical less work and that's what we're always used to doing is all this physical work we have to be hands-on we don't have to do that with the right players mm -hmm. there's multiple people in this that make this happen and so that's the biggest part to overcome honestly was partnering because to trust other people was something that we had not done before so mm -hmm. to know that's why joining a proper mentorship group mastermind where people have been vetted prior and you know everyone is coming in with the same agenda you know which is a, a good agenda a trustworthy if people have integrity that was huge so that's where is yes we're going to put this investment in to meet these right people because otherwise we don't we don't we're not going to do it on our own and we don't it's hard to trust people so that was the biggest thing and then when he showed up to the event like these are good people and let me ask you about that that uh last question for me because this is important mm -hmm. how how is how do you work well with your husband because you, you, you've done multiple businesses with him he trusts mm -hmm. you you're up in connecticut putting floorboards down while he's flying back down Let, mm -hmm. give the listeners just a little bit of an idea how 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 it can be awesome working with your spouse yeah, I think your ego needs to get checked and left at the door and know that we each have our own strengths and weaknesses and finding out which path each one should go on and conquer while the other one supports the other person. That's been how we've made it work. And there were some bumps in the road in the beginning, because even when we bought the franchise, moving from San Diego to Florida, we were doing that together. And I was everything on the back end and he was a physical installer. And it was like, who's doing more work and, you know, just ridiculous. So like, this is not happening. So that's when we decided to really figure out our paths. And do you guys do goal setting? Do you set goals? I mean, do you, mm. do you have weekly meetings? Uh, what does the rhythms look like? Yeah. So we, we each have our own weekly goals that we do separately. Um, but we do quarterly goals and we do yearly goals and we do five-year goals. Wow. That's awesome. And would you recommend everyone else work with their spouses? I don't know. <laughs> <Depends>. <laughs> I was going to say, depends. yes. I thought you were going to say, yeah, go for no. it. But like, <laughs> You don't know. Like, sometimes it just, some people just can't make it work and don't push something that is a struggle. Sometimes you're just better off. But I mean, it's let's, everyone's Let's different. talk about that though. I mean, <laughs> what wh I think everyone has the capability to work with their significant other. I, I, I truly believe that. If, I mean, if you're, you're sharing, it's like, to me, family life and business are sort of the same thing. I mean, you have kids, you're married, you have certain core values, you have certain ideals that you live for, and your business is built with sort of the same ideals, core values, and mission statement, and they sort of blend in one another. I just, I, and I think if you could, if anyone listens to this, if you have the opportunity to work with your spouse, it is, it is, it can be a lot of fun. It, I'm yeah. obviously it's very challenging, but how many things in life aren't are challenging but they're so worth doing i mean very, the very few things in life are easy not worth doing so i don't want christina to scare you off and to say no don't do it <laughs> i would say try it and and, and take I, I think your advice is, is so spot on but isn't ego the problem of everything it doesn't yeah. ego destroy every single thing it just ego and blind spots and i think uh you know the problem is that what happens depending on a person's background one person may feel as if lower self-esteem they need to show themselves and it's competition there's no com competition between spouses you're working together towards the same goal if you've got a better idea than me i have to man up and say hey 
your idea is better than mine. Let's execute on that. I think that's the problem. But then right. that's not only working with your spouses, that's rather working with your employees or your partners. That can get in the way of that as well. I just think the spouse is just so connected to you that, I mean, it, it may, it, you're, you're working on it and talking about it a, a, all day long. So for sure. And to your point, it makes you stronger, like 100% stronger if you work together. It's just a matter of if you're, if you're able to get past those barriers and, deal with the fights that will happen with them along the way. And it will make you stronger and a better couple. Absolutely. Is it, isn't it better to fight than not to say yes. anything at all? Cause I think most people, oh some, I mean, a lot of them, like one goes to work here, one goes to work there. Mm -hmm. They come home late, they have separate days. And then at nighttime they try to, you know, and then they may have weekends and go on vacation a little bit. And, and for me, that never worked for me. Even when I was at the restaurant, my wife would still come in sometimes and work mm -hmm. or she'd come and bring the kids in. And then it was just like, okay, I came home and she stayed home and, and it was sort of yes. like, she's running the household, but I'm part of the household. Right. And then I'm running right. the business and she's helped me with the business on i just never saw why would we would separate that for me it was just it was it was awesome that's the you're living the entrepreneur's lifestyle basically that that's what i think it is and it's it's an exciting lifestyle it's not for everybody but for those of the for those people who want to i guess step out of their comfort zone and before i let you give your uh information because i want people to reach out to you where they can reach out to you if people go back and listen to this i, mean, I think the, the big recurring theme with Christina is she just tried stuff. And if it didn't work, she moved on to the next thing. And I think once she saw that going out there and having limiting beliefs about networking, networking doesn't have to be that way. You can find the right group. It may take you a while to find that right group. And then once you learn and you get into the game, don't have to get the rightus. I got to get a deal. I got to do a deal. I got to do a deal. It's okay. In the grand scheme of things, if you live to be 70 years old and you need to wait 12 months or a year, to find a deal? Is it that long in the grand scheme of things? Because then once you have that one deal, you may find the next deal three months later, like we did. And then six months later, the next deal. So within a couple of years, you may look back and go, wow, I'm already at a hundred units. And I think that's, that's the awesome part. I also think you had spoken about choosing the right people. I mean, like as far as values-based decision-making, the right partners, make sure you enjoy working with them. That's so important when you're working because when you're, when you're dealing with partners, you may do one deal, but if you continue to do deals with that partnership, it en ends up ultimately becoming a marriage and understanding that your goals and your vision really need to align and know what your core values are and know what theirs are to align. Can you give the listeners uh, a, a way to reach out to you? Yeah, the best way, my website, christinakovach.com. There's a calendar link on there where we can schedule a call. And I just love to connect. So her last name is K-O-V-A-C-S, mm -hmm. everybody. I almost butchered that one, but it was uh, she saved me on that. ChristinaKovach.com. I want to thank you for being on the show. It's been, it's been a pleasure. I, I love the story and continued success. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gina.